Good afternoon, everyone. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this webinar on anti-Black racism. Before going further, we will begin with the land acknowledgement, then some guidelines on the technique, and we will proceed with the webinar. We have a lot to discuss, so uh, we're gonna really have a good one hour with, with everyone. And don't forget to write your questions because there are a lot of discussions that will go in on. So we will begin, begin by acknowledging that although we are meeting virtually, we are meeting on indigenous land that has been inhabited by indigenous people from the beginning. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here. And we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, as we gather there, as we gather here, there have been indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of this place. In particular, I acknowledge the land from which I and the panelists are speaking from today the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg peoples. I also want to acknowledge the indigenous territories which participants may be watching from. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historical, historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other indigenous people have made both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular and our province and country as a whole. We recognize the contributions and historic importance of indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities. And in particular to bring for murdered and missing indigenous women and girls across our country. And I will uh, give you some advice on the techniques so you know exactly what to do uh, when it's time, when times come. So uh, to access the box in, and ask your questions, you have to open the Q&A window, which is uh, below the screen, the screen, and that will allowing you to ask questions to the host and panelists. They can either reply back to you via text in the Q&A window or answer your question live. Uh, in regards to the interpretation, we also have a little glob at the far end on your right. So you can click on that uh, globe and you will see uh, a list of um, possibilities. So you will have French, English, or both languages. So uh, feel free to choose the one you are, or you feel comfortable with. Um, for the chat and, uh, chat and raise hand will not be used on this webinar. So no microphone or mic or camera will be available for attendees, only for the panelists, the participant, and uh, myself. So we have a lot to do, a lot, a lot to say. So uh, I won't keep you long, and I will um, now present uh, Chris Elward who is the president of uh, BSAC. Chris Elwood was elected at the National President of the Public Service Alliance of Canada at BSAC's 18th National Triennial Convention in May 2018. He previously served as BSAC's National Executive Vice President from 2012 to 2018. So it's a pleasure for me to have Chris on board with us. So I will pass on the mic do we have a mic? I don't have, <laughs> still thinking like a radio host. So we have Chris, so, so <laughs> no further ado, I will pass the, the light to him. 
Thank you. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Darlan. Thank you very much. And I do want to thank uh, everybody for joining this very important uh, webinar uh, this evening. Anti-Black racism, it's everyone's fight. The PSAC is committed to fighting anti-Black racism in our workplaces, in our union, and certainly in our communities. And we know this means more than just holding webinars and information sessions. I wanna thank everyone who has joined the webinar to ask your questions and get your questions answered and to learn about anti-Black racism. And more importantly, to explore ways of how we can do this together. I also wanna thank, of course, our panelists, Larry, Richard, and uh, Goretti. Thank you very much for doing this today. The last few months really highlighted anti-Black racism. But what we've seen in the last few months are only some examples of deep-rooted anti-Black racism throughout our society. And it shows that anti-Black racism and the oppression, it's hundreds years old, and it's time that we stopped it. And it's time that we all fought against it together. For years, there's been calls for strategies around anti-Black racism. And it's time we started listening to those strategies and putting those strategies in place. And that, of course, includes the disagreed data that we so desperately need. Education on anti-Black racism is so much needed. As a union leader, I need it. And so does other leaders inside and outside our union, but so does all workers as well. Whether they're unionized or non-unionized, we all need this so very important training. Magalie Bacard, our National Executive Vice President, and I are so happy to be joining you today on this very important webinar. And again, we thank you. But of course, learning isn't enough. We have to make sure that we take action because only through real action that we'll be able to overcome anti-Black racism. Thank you again for joining us. And again, thank you to our, our guest panelists. Back to you, Darlin. Thank you very much, Chris Elward. It was a pleasure having you on board with us. And uh, before we go, because we're going to start a very deep and difficult conversation. So we, I'm just gonna take two minutes to uh, thank and um, call on our ancestors to guide us, to give us strength and uh, humility to have during that conversation. We're here to heal together. We're here to have a discussion to, so we can uh, elevate, we can become uh, more human. And by doing so, we need to have that. We need to open our heart as well so we can have a discussion where we all feel comfortable and we can also uh, uh, be an ambassador uh, within our community uh, in that regard. So uh, I will start with uh, the bios. I will present you the panelists that we have today. And then we will start with some uh, with the questions. We have a lot, believe me. But we will start with, you know, mostly with all the questions, and then we will go deeper and deeper. Uh, we'll start with Larry Russo. Larry Russo was elected as CLC Executive Vice President at the CLC's 28th Constitutional Convention in May 2017. Previously, he served as the Regional Executive Vice President of the Visa Alliance of Canada's National Capital Region and as the Regional Vice President of PSAC's Union of National Employees. Larry's first experience in the labor movement and his most meaningful in his opinion was when he was hired as a filing and Stockholm clerk in the mail room of the Canadian Labour Congress at the age of 18. Shortly thereafter, he was elected 
shop steward for the for the office and professional employees international union local 2025 now copy Larry a vécu sa première expérience syndicale en fait il a par la suite été embauché à Statistique Canada où il demeure attaché jusqu'à aujourd'hui il détient un certificat en droit civil de la faculté du droit civil à l'université d'Ottawa et une maîtrise en administration publique de l'école nationale du Québec. Larry est un militant syndical et politique de longue date, notamment sur des questions concernant les relations de travail, la santé, la sécurité, les droits de la personne et l'équité. Sa participation au mouvement LGBT ABI de lutte contre le racisme et pour la paix fait partie intégrante de son engagement envers la justice sociale. A pleasure to have you, Larry. Welcome. Et nous avons avec nous Gauthier, qui travaille à la direction de la représentation et services juridiques de la FPC. Elle occupe principalement le poste d'agente au grief et à l'arbitrage, représentant les membres de la FPC en médiation ou en arbitrage sur une variété de litiges, incluant les congédiements, les plaintes en droit de la personne, ainsi que l'interprétation des conventions collective. Goethe, merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. And the last one, but not the least, Richard. <laughs> I've been working with Richard so long, so I'm kind of, okay, should I say it, sir? <laughs> we'll keep it real. <laughs> so Richard Shop is currently working on an interchange Canada assignment with the Dream Legacy Foundation. His work involves leading initiative in support of Government of Canada commitments to the United Nations Decade for People of African Descent. Richard is one of the founders of the Federal Black Employee Caucus that has been working with federal public service and union leaders to address anti-Black racism in the federal public service. He has held local, regional, and national union positions with the Public Service Alliance of Canada. Canadian Association of Professional Employees and the Manitoba Federation of Labor. Richard's work re regionally, nationally, and within the federal public service is intended to improve the condition of Black and African diaspora communities in Canada. So welcome to all of you. I'm so happy and I, I feel so honored to have you and to moderate that webinar. But we're not here only to have some beautiful smiles, <laughs> isn't it? But to talk very deep and to have a very deep uh, conversation. We've been talking a lot about anti-racism lately, I would say more than ever. And some people are just like asking, why is it, why? What is it and why are we doing that? Why we are having that dis discussion? So I will start with, with uh, Larry. I don't see Larry. I don't know if he's still with us. I see. Okay. Larry's here. Happy to, to see you, to see your face, Larry. So uh, what is systemic anti-Black racism, Larry? And how does it, manifest in workplaces and unions. You're still on mute. Yes, hello everyone and thank you very much. And I'd like to thank, of course, uh, PSAC for this uh, wonderful invitation uh, to uh, do this very important work. I just want to ask very quickly if, um, um, uh, if I, if I do this, uh, did you did you lose my video? But can you hear me? We can hear you, but you won't. We won't be able to see you. Ah, okay, very good. So, uh, just bear with me because I'm going to uh, I'm going to try and 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 do this uh, as best as I can. Okay, so I I I, I do think that it's a very uh, important question, uh, and uh, we we need. To, to discuss uh, systemic anti-black racism 
uh, by going to the roots, the very roots of where and how it started. Mm -hmm. And it started when white European merchants and traders decided that the best answer to the practically impossible problem of working the immensely rich and fertile territories of the Americas was to get cheap labor from Africa, which was slave labor. And so the first shoots of anti-Black racism appeared. But buying, kidnapping, and otherwise enslaving Black Africans on their continent and bringing them in the most horrible of conditions to the Americas was one thing. Once the crime was committed, the only way to justify it would therefore be through the debasement and the dehumanization of these Black Africans and of, of course, their descendants. Therefore, the debasement of an entire race of people would begin. Treating human beings as chattel or livestock and reinforcing their dehumanization would form the basis for a system established to justify enslavement. When the first and only slave revolt in Haiti in 1804 resulted 20 years later in the extortion of the new young black republic by having the very black liberated slaves in turn pay ruinous amounts of money over the next 125 years in the form of reparations to the former white slave and plantation owners in France, all of which was supported and enforced by all the other European slave-owning nations, essential pillar of systemic anti-Black racism was installed. When the Civil War of 1861 tore the United States asunder and the Union President Lincoln freed the slaves, the ensuing post-Reconstruction Jim Crow backlash would lead to a systemic and systematic anti-Black oppression that expanded throughout the United States and lasts in many varied forms to this day. Examples of this are the denials of freedom to own property where Blacks were excluded from entire swaths of lands, neighborhoods, and homes in every corner of the United States, the denials of freedom to vote, the most basic of democratic freedoms, through the imposition of impossible conditions and eligibilities, the absolute economic suppression and oppression of black folks in industry and finance, as well as academia, leading in part to the establishment of separate historically black universities and colleges. All of this and so much more are the examples and manifestations and proof of the historical roots of systemic anti-Black racism. Now, for all you folks out there who are ready to say, well, this was mostly in the United States, a quick word on Canadian history. Allow me to quote extensively from Arthur Deacon's 1926 essay entitled The Bogey of Annexation, an historical account of the origins of Canadian nationalism. And I quote, after the Seven Years' War, during which Quebec fell to General Wolfe in 1759, England was by no means proud of her new possession. Instead, she was keen to own the little island of Guadeloupe, for sugar was just beginning to be an important commodity. France, being equally anxious to retain Guadeloupe in Canada, a deadlock in the peace negotiations lasted until Benjamin Franklin who later became Canada's first postmaster general, pointed out that while Canada was worthless in itself, it might be dangerous from a military standpoint to have a foreign power, namely France, situated so near the New England colonies. So in 1763, Canada became British. Further on, Deacon writes, at the time of the American Revolution, Canada was essentially a French colony England had acquired almost unwillingly. The first important wave of immigration came from the United States and was made up of people who had been driven from their homes because they were opposed to the revolution. In the United States, they were known as royalists. In Canada, they were called loyalists, and they established a tradition and founded a national sentiment which has affected the whole trend of Canadian thought and of which the present Canadian nationalistic movement is a natural outgrowth. They had been assured protection in the revolting colonies, but Alexander Hamilton, yielding to popular demand, confiscated their property, 
So they came to their new homes in Canada with a grudge and a grievance, believing they had been hardly and dishonorably used. About 100,000 of them came in all, settling in the maritime provinces, in Quebec and in Ontario. A great proportion represented the old colonial aristocracy and were persons of wealth and education. Into Nova Scotia alone in the first migration went no less than 200 graduates of Harvard and 200 graduates of other colleges, including the Chief Justice and three out of the four judges of the Superior Court of Massachusetts. They were used to North American life, and while they went as exiles, old homes, they were imbued with a love for free institutions and early determined to build up in the North the kind of country they had desired to make up the American colonies. Judge Thomas Chandler Halliburton was the Nova Scotia-born son of one of these loyalists. In a recent biography of him, Dr. J.D. Logan says, quote, the loyalist emigres of Scotia, even past Halliburton's earlier days, continued to regard the revolutionists of the United States, listen to this, as renegades so inferior to themselves in birth and culture that eventually the vulgar democracy of the United States would of necessity become self-cancered and the people politically enfeebled. Meanwhile, the descendants of the exiled Tory aristocrats would grow into a mighty people in British North America, and this new strong nation in due season would win over the enfeebled republic to join with them. Now, I'm not going to go there, but I am going to switch right now to French. Alors, plusieurs poseront la question, pourquoi parler d'histoire? Eh bien, j'ai un oncle qui me disait toujours, Larry, si tu ne connais pas ton histoire, tu ne peux pas savoir qui tu es. Le portrait un peu romancé qu'on apprend à l'école des loyalistes qui sont arrivés au Canada ne reflète pas toute la réalité ni toute la vérité. Expulsé pendant la Révolution américaine, tout en demeurant loyal à la monarchie britannique, ils ont maintenu les structures colonialistes de l'aristocratie britannique dont ils émanaient ou dont ils voulaient absolument faire partie. Une aristocratie en pleine expansion, profitant des richesses provenant du travail des esclaves sur des terres des Autochtones. Si les loyalistes croyaient que les révolutionnaires américains étaient nettement inférieurs par naissance et culture, on ne peut qu'imaginer quelle était leur opinion des Autochtones dont ils avaient volé les terres, sans parler de ce qu'ils pensaient des esclaves noirs qu'ils ont amenés avec eux et qui étaient essentiels au maintien de leur richesse et de leur pouvoir. Ça prendrait encore au moins une cinquantaine d'années avant que l'Angleterre abolisse l'esclavage dans ses colonies, incluant le Canada. Mais en toute réalité, est-ce que quelqu'un pense réellement, en toute franchise et honnêtement, que ces loyalistes aristocrates qui nourrissaient des griefs et plaintes contre les, révolution les révolutionnaires américains de les avoir expropriés penseraient un seul instant que leurs propres esclaves auraient droit à la liberté, voire la compensation? La communauté noire en Nouvelle-Écosse a subi des centaines d'années de racisme systémique ou ancré par l'establishment loyaliste pour les garder à leur place. Et je n'hésiterai pas un seul instant à croire que leur opinion aristocrate et colonialiste était que tous les esclaves, leurs esclaves étaient des êtres inférieurs de par leur naissance et culture, voire leur couleur. Alors, soyons clairs en ce qui concerne le Canada. Les racines profondes du racisme anti-noir se trouvent ancrées chez les loyalistes qui étaient essentiels à représenter et avancer le système d'oppression et de gouvernance contre les Autochtones et les Noirs. Ce racisme anti-Autochtone et anti-Noir était à la base du vol et de l'occupation des terres, ainsi que le travail esclavagiste nécessaire à l'accumulation de la richesse de l'aristocratie britannique, dont les structures politiques, financières et sociales étaient au maintien du pouvoir et du contrôle des colonies et des terres. Et je ne voudrais pas un seul instant vider ou passer outre 
le racisme que les colonialistes français pouvaient exercer contre leurs propres esclaves et personnes de, de race noire. Mais aux conquérants vainqueurs loyalistes, dans le cas du Canada, tout honneur et toute responsabilité aussi. Alors, le racisme systémique est toute expression et ou application de racisme exercé par les structures économiques, politiques et sociales d'une société contre toute race de personnes qui leur ferment les voies à la pleine expression de leur humanité, de vivre la vie dont ils ont le droit en toute égalité, avec accès et opportunité au traitement égal et ce, équitablement et à même titre que toute autre personne dans cette société. Ça, c'est la définition anti-racisme noir de Larry Rousseau. Une analyse <rire> logique de ce que je viens de présenter, basée sur les faits, ne peut que mener à la conclusion que le racisme systémique existe bel et bien dans la société canadienne et cela s'applique à nos milieux de travail et, oui, nos syndicats. Au milieu de travail, ça se manifeste lorsqu'une personne de la population blanche en milieu de travail croit que la personne noire est inférieure par la naissance et la culture et la couleur, que ce soit par un double standard ou une subjectivité appliquée dans l'évaluation des demandes d'emploi ou de promotion, ou les évaluations de rendement en milieu de travail, et ou le non-respect de ce que les employés noirs peuvent dire et accomplir dans leur travail, incluant les attitudes paternalistes et condescendantes, les comportements inacceptables de race noire, et j'en passe. Dans les structures syndicales, ces mêmes comportements peuvent se trouver lorsqu'on doit traiter des griefs ou des plaintes provenant des membres noirs. Trop de membres noirs pensent qu'ils ne sont pas représentés ou défendus de façon adéquate dans des cas d'antiracisme noir et trop de personnes noires croient qu'il est difficile, voire impossible, de se faire bien représenter dans ces cas lorsque les, leurs défenseurs n'ont aucune idée de ce que c'est d'être victime de racisme et qui n'ont pas l'expérience de du harcèlement ou de la discrimination que peut vivre une personne de race noire en milieu de travail. In closing, as food for thought, allow me to quote Lynn Jones, a now retired but still very active and noted PSAC black trade unionist in Nova Scotia, who wrote the following in her recent letter to Marie Claude, Chief Commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, and I quote, What I am not as pleased about has been your ability to address the systemic racism and discrimination throughout the federal public service and your lack of resolve to attack the corporate culture change that will actually result in the differences we are seeking. Your present announcement regarding a review of gaps in management positions for African people in the federal public service is another way of stalling the need to make the changes required. The time for review is over. That work has been done a multitude of times over an embarrassing number of years. Miigwech, thanks, merci, and I'm looking for the rest of this webinar. Thank you, Larry. Uh, on a uh, pas beaucoup thank de you temps. very much, merci. Okay, maintenant, parce que les gens demandaient, pourtant on te voyait plus. Allez rapidement avec Goretti. Goretti, il y a des processus qui sont mis en branle pour justement parler et euh, travailler sur, sur le, le problème de racisme anti-noir et, et toute, forme de, de raci toute, forme, toute forme de racisme en fait à la FPC. Alors, ce qu'on aimerait savoir, c'est que quels seront ou quels sont les processus qui sont mis en place dans le milieu de travail pour remédier au problème, à ce problème-là? au racisme anti-noir anti et quels seront les bénéfices et les défis à, à ce niveau. Merci, euh, chère Darlene. Vous posez une question assez importante, euh, à savoir quels sont les processus en milieu de travail pour lutter contre le racisme anti-noir. Euh, moi, je dirais plutôt, est-ce qu'il y a même des processus qui sont adaptés pour lutter mm -hmm. contre le racisme anti-noir? Euh, 
qu'il n'y a pas de processus, il n'y a pas un processus en particulier, à mon avis, pour combattre le racisme anti-noir. Il y a des processus, bien entendu, de grief, de plainte, euh, qui sont construits par des conventions collectives ou des lois, des codes des droits de la personne. Toutefois, euh, ces mécanismes n'ont pas un libéré euh, euh, spécifique euh, qui régit le racisme anti-noir. Il ne traite pas d'une façon particulière euh, le racisme anti-noir. Or, on convient à euh, tout le monde, et euh, confrère Brousseau vient de le dire, euh, les Noirs euh, constituent un groupe défavorisé dans notre société. Et d'ailleurs, pour emprunter les mots euh, du tribunal canadien des droits de la personne, dans une décision euh, très récente, c'est la décision Turner, T-U-R-N-E-R, euh, le droit de la personne euh, nous dit ceci, et je vais citer. Le racisme, y compris le racisme anti-noir, est présent dans la société canadienne, non seulement sous des formes manifestes, mais aussi de manière inconsciente chez de nombreuses personnes et dans les institutions qui fondent leurs actions sur des stéréotypes raciaux négatifs, dont ceux visant les Noirs, en particulier de sexe masculin. Euh, et, et le tribunal continue. Certains de ces stéréotypes raciaux négatifs qui visent les hommes Noirs sont que ces derniers sont peu intelligents écoutez-moi, paresseux, que les hommes noirs sont peu intelligents, paresseux, incompétents et malhonnêtes, ce qui leur crée des difficultés dans des situations d'emploi. Alors ça, c'est euh, le tribunal des droits de la personne qui parle. Et dans une autre décision d'ailleurs, euh, du nom de Parc, euh, je continue, de, je cite aussi, on trouve ces commentaires que j'ai trouvés assez intéressants. Et on dit « le racisme, en particulier le racisme anti-noir, fait partie intégrante de la mentalité de notre société. Une couche importante de la société professe ouvertement des vues racistes. Une couche plus large encore est inconsciemment influencée par des stéréotypes raciaux négatifs. De sur quoi nos institutions, y compris la justice pénale, ré reflètent ces stéréotypes négatifs qu'elle perpétue. Ces éléments se conjuguent pour propager le fléau du racisme dans la société entière. Et on termine. Les Noirs sont parmi les principales victimes de ce fléau. Donc, euh, ça, c'est vraiment euh, les cours, les tribunaux qui parlent euh, comment les Noirs, euh, les travailleurs Noirs sont vulnérables sont défavorisés dans le milieu de travail. Et d'ailleurs, en parlant même des processus euh, pour combattre le racisme, euh, permettez-moi de référer encore à un article qui a été écrit par euh, un professeur de faculté de droit de la Colombie-Britannique euh, qui, qui réfère à, à certaines études et il dit des études menées dans, dans beaucoup de juridictions ont indiqué que les plaintes de discrimination alléguées Ayant profondément la race ou des facteurs connexes hein, ont un taux de réussite inférieur à celui des plaintes fondées sur d'autres motifs. Et le premier facteur qui est que les plaintes fondées sur euh, la discrimination raciale sont en moyenne plus difficiles à étoffer. Alors, ça sont des, des, des chercheurs, des auteurs, des tribunaux qui disent comment euh, les plaintes qui soulèvent des questions de discrimination raciale sont très, très difficiles à étoffer. Et euh, cela ne devrait pas étonner la, la discrimination raciale, le harcèlement racial est, est beaucoup plus subtil. Ce n'est pas seulement euh, les, 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 les insultes verbaux, ça peut être non-verbal, ça peut être psychologique. Euh, ça peut apparaître euh, dans l'embauche, dans la formation, dans l'évaluation, euh, dans les avantages, dans les promotions, et j'en passe. Alors, le fait d'appliquer, donc, on a dans, la, dans, dans nos conventions collectives et dans les lois, euh, vous, allez tous, vous avez tous probablement vu qu'il y a 
Ah bah oui, une clause qui vous dit il est illégal pour l'employeur ou c'est représentant de faire de la discrimination fondée sur la race. Euh, et on inclut d'autres motifs, bien entendu, prohibés, la couleur, le sexe et le genre, mm -hmm. euh, la religion et l'origine nationale. Cela s'applique à toutes les situations, donc, y compris la race. Mais la question, il n'y a pas vraiment euh, un processus distinct, euh, réservé ou adapté à la discrimination raciale, bien mm -hmm. que les tribunaux, effectivement, nous disent euh, le racisme est noir est évident, les noirs euh, font l'objet d'un traitement différent, très différent, mais il n'y a pas une distinction dans, dans, dans les libellés, dans le langage de nos conventions collectives, les droits ou les codes de droits de la personne, et langage différent qui traite particulièrement euh, le racisme et le noir. Donc, la question qui se pose est de savoir si ces processus actuellement en place euh, atteignent l'objectif de protéger les noirs. Moi, je dirais non. Euh, alors, est-ce qu'ils ont même l'objectif de protéger les Noirs? C'est la question euh, qu'il faut euh, aborder. Alors, les griefs qui nous arrivent à, à, à l'AFPC, euh, ce n'est pas beaucoup de griefs de, de, de discrimination raciale. Et s'il n'y a pas beaucoup, ça ne veut pas dire qu'il qu qu n'y a pas de problème. On en a dit qu'on fait ça en, en appréciant vous aussi. Um, C'est-à-dire que, mais il y a un élément commun qu'on qu remarque. Les victimes uh, ont fait l'objet d'un harcèlement ou de discrimination pendant plusieurs années. Ils ont déposé un grief probablement um, quand ils sont arrivés uh, au point culminant, c'est-à-dire quand la, la goutte a débordé le vase. C'est-à-dire qu'on est dans une situation de congédiement. Et uh, quand vous demandez euh, pourquoi vous n'avez pas déposé votre plainte, votre grief au moment, il y a des délais, bien entendu, j'en ai parlé, des conventions collectives, et c'est mm -hmm. pas ces lois, ils ont des délais, les délais sont, sont assez courts pour une personne qui est dans la détresse, pour une personne qui vient de subir un congédiement. Alors, la personne va vous dire, euh, j'avais peur des représailles, je ne voulais pas euh, perdre mon emploi. <rire> vous connaissez tous. Un noir, déjà, pour décrocher un emploi, c'est difficile. Et le perdre, parfois, c'est lui ou elle-même qui nourrit sa famille. Euh, quand on perd son emploi, ce n'est pas le moment. Euh, probablement, euh, on ne pense pas directement aller déposer un grief, une plainte. On passe à aller chercher un autre emploi, deux emplois même, pour euh, boucler les deux bouts du mois. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on, les conséquences qu'on a avec ça, c'est que euh, les faits discriminatoires ne seront pas examinés par les tribunaux ou euh, les commissions euh, parce que euh, certains faits, parce que euh, les est tard, euh, ils sont en dehors des délais, ils ne peuvent pas être entendus. Alors, euh, il y aura des choses qu'on ne va jamais savoir. Euh, par rapport à ces discriminations, à ces comportements euh, qui se passent en milieu de travail. Alors, il y a beaucoup de défis, il y a beaucoup de défis. Euh, Confrère Rousseau en a parlé, il y a aussi, euh, parmi les défis qu'on qu note, il y a la perte de confiance dans le système. Euh, je ne sais pas si vous avez entendu, euh, il y a quelques années, il y a deux années, deux femmes noires, employés à la, par la fonction publique de l'Ontario, euh, ont poursuivi euh, le gouvernement Ontario et leur syndicat pour euh, alléguer qu'elles avaient subi des années de racisme et de discrimination systémique, euh, alors euh, que le syndicat n'avait pas aidé en, en dépose à des, des, des griefs par rapport à, à leur plainte. Alors, la question qui est venue, les personnes sont parties chercher une remède devant la Cour supérieure de l'Ontario. Ce n'est pas le bon forum, mais d'ailleurs, euh, la Cour supérieure de justice de l'Ontario vient de rendre une décision par rapport à cette situation qui est sortie, la décision est sortie le 7 avril euh, dernier, en disant ce n'est pas le bon forum, malheureusement. Euh, vous aurez dû aller devant le tribunal des droits de la personne. Les questions que vous soulevez, ce sont des questions sont régis par vos conventions collectives. Et donc, imaginez, les personnes ont été discriminées, ils ont été malmenées, euh, ils ont perdu confiance 
dans le système, non seulement dans l'employeur, mais aussi dans le syndicat qui les représentait. Ils ont pris un mauvais chemin. Euh, vous savez, quand vous êtes devant un cours, le stress, euh, l'argent, euh, tout ça sont des conséquences, malheureusement, qui viennent de la perte de, de, de confiance dans le système. Alors, j'ai parlé tantôt euh, de la peur de perdre l'emploi. Pour les Noirs, c'est très important. Euh, mais il y a aussi euh, le manque de sécurité d'emploi pour nos confrères et nos consoeurs noirs. Euh, ces personnes-là, ils sont beaucoup plus dans des terres, dans des destinations à terre. Um, et quand vous êtes dans une situation de, de, de non-sécurité pour l'emploi, bien entendu, vous allez avoir tendance de vous résigner par rapport à la discrimination et par rapport au, au harcèlement. Alors, euh, ils vont être assignés à plusieurs termes successifs et sur des années. Et ça a été d'ailleurs... Euh, 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 le temps pour euh, la, la même décision, la décision tournante euh, qu'on a eue, euh, une personne euh, qui, qui, qui invoque la discrimination raciale, euh, mais qui avait été placée euh, dans beaucoup de, de termes et des assignations. Euh, malheureusement, euh, les délais ont été très longs et euh, alors qu'il il avait déposé son grief en 2005, euh, au moment où on se parle, à 2020, on est en train de parler de son cas. Alors, euh, je, je vais m'arrêter ici. Merci beaucoup, Darlene. Miigwech. Merci, Goethe. Merci beaucoup. OK, so we are receiving a lot of questions. So I hope that we will have at least uh, maybe five minutes to do roundtable in regards to the question. Actually, I will pick maybe one question, but I will go with Richard on that. Focus, fo focusing on the federal public service, what are the issues and FBEX fighting on anti-Black racism in the federal public service now? Thank you, Darlene. Uh, and I appreciate the opening comments uh, by uh, Brother Larry uh, Russo and, and our sister Goretti, who pretty much summed up uh, a lot of what I would originally have said um, about the history uh, of how foundational anti-Black racism is to, to this country, to all of our institutions uh, that, make, uh, that make Canada uh, what it is today, uh, that uh, the many issues that we're facing in our uh, workplaces uh, have its root in its history and in, in, in the foundation of, of, of Canada. Uh, anti-blackness, uh, as was uh, the enslavement of our people, uh, is still something that manifests today uh, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our communities, in our places of work, uh, when we're driving to work and being pulled over for that driving while black violation. Um, so uh, I very much appreciate the context that was set uh, by uh, our, our CLC brother and, uh, and, uh, and, and Goretti. I um, also wanted to sort of acknowledge the initial comments by um, President Chris uh, Aylward. Um, the comments are, are important, the, the statements are important, and of course we want to see uh, those statements backed up through action throughout this union and, and, and others. Um, my comments around, you know, uh, FBEC, I think, will be kind of framed around my experiences within the federal public service as a, as a black man supporting other black and racialized people as a unionist uh, for years as a PSAC representative and then as a, uh, a CAPE representative uh, uh, um, uh, when I changed jobs. Um, and so one of the things that I think is important for us to, to, to recognize and is that uh, many of our people have experienced uh, anti-black racism sometimes from the moment that they arrive in their workplaces. Mm -hmm. um, our people could could tell stories, um, you know, can people want to touch their hair? Uh, people, being, people, people, people being called uh, nigger in their, in their workplace by colleagues and supervisors. Uh, people, you know, uh, being ignored and put into corners uh, by themselves away from their teams. Um, you know, people being passed over promotions. And probably the worst of all, the joke within the federal public service is when a, a black person who is seasoned and well experienced 
trains a, a young white student or a one young white colleague who eventually becomes their boss. And sometimes they are treated uh, just as badly by that person they trained. Uh, so, you know, these kinds of things prey uh, impact on the mental health uh, of, our, of our brothers and sisters that work in our workplaces. Uh, it, it creates a sense of fear, as, as, as Goretti was saying. People are afraid to stand up when mm -hmm. these things happen. Uh, they're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of what happened to our people over the last 250 years in this country, uh, the last two generations. Uh, we know what happens to us in the workplace. Uh, so people have been uh, uh, woefully afraid. And I think probably one of the, the biggest challenges that we face, and, and I've been a union person for maybe about 20 years, and more than half of the people that I have helped uh, around race-based complaints uh, have been black and racialized, is the challenges that our people have when they do go to the unions. And I'm saying all unions, not just PSAC. Uh, there are challenges that people have when they go to the unions. Uh, and I think we can have this conversation a bit about allyship and what the unions can do to ally. Um, people uh, are not believed. When we come with our cases of racism and harassment, and discrimination based on race, we are not believed. And that lack of belief is not just on the part of the employer, but also the union. There's education work that is required on the parts of the union to be able to address this in a, in, a, in, real way, in a real terms. Like we're paying union dues for people to, to work with us, not against us. Uh, there's, there's, there's challenges in understanding what our issues are. Um, white people who work in the union and who make a majority of our unions um, do not have the lived experience to know what it's like to be black or brown. And that sometimes makes it difficult for them to understand or, or see the issues. Uh, so it, it's 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 part partly training, but again, it's it's a, it's about it's about being believed. I very much appreciate what Goretti was saying about the um, the processes that are in place. Um, there are many failures in terms of uh, processes, and just uh, union processes, but the regular uh, policies around uh, diversity and inclusion and uh, gender-based analysis plus, where all the black people and brown people are hanging on the little plus, trying to get recognized. Uh, GBA plus is for white women, and we're added there as a, as a, as a stand-in. Diversity and inclusion has been, and has always been, um, the policy instrument for the All Lives Matter movement. It means that those of us who are black are nowhere in these diversity and inclusion initiatives, policies, and unfortunately that means that uh, when we have something like George Floyd happen in the workplace, uh, the, this, this, this moment, this incredible historic moment when everybody on this planet saw uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, this white supremacist agent of the state as a police officer bleed the life out of our brother, our uncle, uh, my son, uh, me. Uh, mm -hmm. And we see this, and, and so in a way that people couldn't, turn away, they couldn't turn it off. They saw it from beginning to end and people realized, everybody realized for the first time that this is our lives, not just when it comes to policing, but in our workplaces and in our schools and in the malls. Uh, and when we're trying to get over the border, this is what our lives are like. So when we have institutions and when we have organizations that have these policies that don't reflect the black experience, then we of course will see what we're seeing now in terms of the low uptake of grievances that are brought up by, by race. Uh, employees not wanting to bother going to uh, the, the process. And, and if they go through the process, union management processes, and they fail and they go to the Human Rights Commission, they know, we all know, that when we send complaints to the Canadian Human Rights Commission, uh, and I think uh, my brother Larry alluded to this, that most of these cases based on race are dismissed. So we don't have avenues uh, to address our issues in a way that the state and with the organizations will support. Uh, and that will help to support us receiving redress and becoming whole and actually maintaining our humanity in the workplace. So there's, 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 uh, there's so much that needs to be done. And, and, and so when, you know, a couple of years ago, when we heard as black employees 
that there was this thing called the United Nations Decade for People of African Descent. And that people, the government of Canada was adopting this decade and, and stating that we were going to do a number of initiatives to do right by Black Canadians. Well, members of our Black public servant groups started saying, well, why don't we form a group and start dealing with these issues for the first time in government? That was two years ago. So that's when FBEC was born. FBEC was born specifically, fundamentally, to make the UN decade real within the federal public service. The UN decade focuses on three pillars, recognition, justice, and development. All we want really is justice <laughs> within the public service. We wanna address these issues around anti-black racism that we all know is real, but we have no real concerted ways uh, of dealing with. So in, in engaging through FBEC, well, we, we went to our, our, our union partners, our union brothers and sisters. We've engaged with the president of PSAC, the president of CAPE, the president of PIPS, the financial president union. Um, we've, we've engaged with some of the smaller unions too to start having conversations about how to address the black experience through a union. We also had a, a sit down with the CLC uh, at one point, I think in, 20, in 2018 in the early days uh, to try to get a sense of how we could all work together to improve what union does live up to its promise to support us as workers in, in the workplace, all workers, not just white workers, mm -hmm. but all workers. Um, so we, 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 we've seen over, over time, there's this uh, ongoing uh, work with, uh, with FBEC has been around addressing these issues with unions, with senior management. We've met with a whole bunch of deputy ministers, met with a whole bunch of committees, employees, and our group is, is growing. We're growing exponentially. And black employees are joining FBEC across the country because they want to be part of something that represents them, that reflects them. We also encourage people who are part of FBEC to join their unions and be part of unions, to be part of those existing union structures. PSAC has a racially visible uh, advisory committee um, that we encourage people to be part of, and we are participating in terms of our PSAC members. Uh, so... I didn't want to get into all the solutions, but just to say what we're doing. We're working on this stuff to try to make sure that we address this stuff for the first time in government. The UN decade is more than halfway done. The government of Canada adopted it three years late. Uh, we're only just now getting going and we only have less than four years before the UN decade is over. And then after that, this historic moment is done and we may have to wait another 25 years before we get something else that allows us to focus on our issues. So during this time of the George Floyd effect, where people are feeling woke for a minute, we know that minute's gonna be gone in about two months. So what can we do as unionists, as employees, as allies, to support black employees and institutions, or these white institutions that we work in, to make sure that our rights are being respected uh, and that we uh, are, are, like I said, maintain our humanity and still can go to work and, and be whole. As right now, that's not the case. Uh, in fact, <laughs> complaints and concerns from people from even within unions, the PSAC has issues in terms of its own foundation. The Canadian Human Rights Commission's employees are in the middle of revolt. Uh, that all of the unions have issues with, within them that have to deal with anti-Black racism. Uh, what I'll, I'll end here in terms of some of the things that we're doing with the unions, we've had, and we've had a conversation with the, uh, the, the, the four presidents that I had mentioned before about having uh, an anti-black uh, racism training for senior leaders uh, so that we can start to sensitize from the top down what anti-black racism is. Uh, we can get support for changes to things like the Employment Equity Act so that we're not treated as visible minorities. We're not visible minorities. I'm Jamaican Canadian. We have Senegalese, we've got Haitians, we've got black Nova Scotians. We're not, we're not visible minorities. And when you lump us in there, our experiences are lost and the United Nations backs up that assertion. So we need to get into the 21st century when it comes to representing and supporting our people. It cannot just be what we've been doing for the last 25 years. That has not worked for us. And it's obvious that our processes that are in place are lacking. So I'm happy to be part of the conversations around remedies uh, in the last uh, 20 minutes or so that we have. 
uh, because uh, we're, we're now, I think, beyond the time of, uh, of talking about the issues. I think we're now at a place where we're talking about how do we move forward towards sort of constructive, systematic change to our institutions. And that includes within the union movement to ensure that there's space for black people and that we're addressing the issues that are most important to us and our children and our children's children who will be in these workplaces after us. So thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I will, uh, because we, we are receiving a lot of uh, questions from the participants, but before we go there, I just want to ask a question. You know, in America, we like to have a happy ending in all stories, right? But we know in that case, the, the, the happy ending is not yet to come. We still have to work hard. And um, so to, to, to be able to arrive there, to have that happy ending, what can we do? Uh, are we doing the right thing, the way that we are operating now to, to have that happy ending or to have that equality we are looking for and we are working so hard to have. I will start with uh, Gauti and then Larry and Richard. So your question was, do we have what we need? What was your it's, question again, sorry? Uh, the question is, do we, are we really, uh, um, the way that we are proceeding now, is it relevant? Is it uh, for you in your, mine it's the right thing we are doing it correctly uh is there anything that we can change to make it possible to make that equality uh possible merci beaucoup d'arlene pour la question je pense que um, est-ce que vous pouvez m'entendre oui mm -hmm. absolument oui vous pouvez m'entendre um, si vous demandez qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire il euh, n'y a pas à mon avis une euh, comment dirais-je une euh, solution magique on parle d'un système de discrimination euh, raciale systémique euh, il n'y a pas une seule solution euh, on aurait aimé avoir vraiment comme euh, une euh, comment dirais-je un bateau magique mais on n'en a pas. Mais je crois que euh, c'est un moment, comme euh, euh, frère euh, Richard a dit, qu'on qu passe aux actions, au moins à débattre qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire. Um, alors, si, si moi je compare um, le racisme anti-noir comme cette pandémie dans laquelle nous sommes, Et chacun de nous est appelé vraiment à poser son acte. Uh, C'est-à-dire qu'en commençant chez nous, uh, chaque personne doit faire sa part afin que nous puissions combattre le racisme anti-noir. Um, parce que um, si ch chacun de nous ne fait pas sa part, on ne pourra jamais arriver à éradiquer uh, ce fléau. Je vais juste vous donner une petite uh, anecdote. Uh, Rousseau, merci beaucoup pour uh, votre, uh, votre article que vous avez posté il y a quelques jours, vous avez dit, l'éducation commence à, à, chez nous, à la maison. Mm -hmm. Alors, quand je dis que ça, chaque personne a, un, a, a sa part mm -hmm. là-dedans, um, je vais, si vous permettez, vous donner un petit anecdote. Um, il y a quelques années, moi, j'ai été euh, déménagée dans une nouvelle place. Alors, je suis dehors. Euh, avec mes enfants, on est en train de travailler dans la cour arrière. Il y a des enfants qui fêtent un anniversaire euh, euh, une dizaine d'enfants en dessous de 10 ans, probablement autour de 5 ans. Alors, euh, euh, ces enfants-là, euh, l'un de ces enfants dit, « Oh, regardez les Noirs, on, on va prendre les bateaux pour les battre. Euh, » Notre enfant dit, « Regardez les Noirs. » Non, 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 il faut plutôt prendre les pierres, on va leur jeter des pierres. Alors, cet enfant-là, si on n'est pas corrigé, n'est pas corrigé, demain, il sera un policier. Cet enfant-là, demain, sera... Euh, comment dirais-je, euh, non seulement un juge, il pourrait être un médecin, un enseignant, euh, représentant syndical. Et, et si cet enfant-là n'est pas corrigé, comment voudriez-vous qu'il euh, va considérer le racisme noir? Alors, ça commence chez vous, ça commence chez nous. Euh, ce n'est pas aussi que euh, dans le milieu de travail, ce n'est pas notre superviseur, notre gestionnaire, c'est chacun de nous. 
qui doivent dénoncer euh, le racisme anti-noir. D'ailleurs, euh, d'ailleurs, dans les décisions que nous gagnons, euh, c'est qu'il y a des personnes qui, qui, qui viennent quand même témoigner, qui disent « Ok, moi j'ai vu des, des, des comportements anti-noirs et ces personnes-là sont prêtes à venir nous aider. » Alors, c'est vraiment comme chacun de nous doit faire de sa part. Merci, Darlene. Merci, Gwethi. Larry? Um, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll say it in English. Uh, so uh, th- yeah, absolutely, Goretti, uh, it, it, you know, you're uh, absolutely right. There is no magic uh, response. But one thing I'd like to talk about is leadership. And um, we have absolute, see it every day, that because the leadership of the American president is, is a racist based in racism and xenophobia and intolerance, that we are seeing more cases mm-hmm. of intolerance and racism than, than I ever would have thought possible since the time I was born 63 years ago in the United States of America, which was a, a very racist and segregated place at that time. It still is. But it's just incredible to see that if there is leadership at the top, that says this is the way we must go, It's then millions of people are going to go down that road. So we have to look at the leadership. When we look at leadership in Canada, I'm very sorry, but when we have leadership in Canada that denies systemic racism, then that gives the tone to how many people in Canada who are going to say there is, there is none. When, so leadership has to recognize, for example, right in the PSAC, Last week, we had, and in the, in, the, in the past week, we saw that there was some contention about this question. There was a very sensitive and, and perhaps contentious reaction to, to, to having a webinar. Yet, the leadership of the PSAC, Chris Aylward and Magali Picard, finally came out after having consulted, of course, and said, listen, We made a mistake, and we are going to rectify that mistake. That's all we need, is for people to recognize, that if, especially in the white mainstream, that if you're going down the wrong path, you can change and say, whoops, this is not the way we should be going. Maybe this is the way we should be going. And the most important thing is for the white mainstream to listen and not to automatically assume that they know what the problems are, what the issues are, and already going halfway to the solution without actually having listened and made sure that they understand from the people concerned, who are Black people in this case, in this instance, that this is, is actually the problem. You cannot find the solution if you don't understand the problem. And so I, I'll, I'll end it there because there is no magic uh, solution, but it is tough. It is difficult to sit down and to listen instead of thinking that you automatically have the answers or that you are taking for granted that people do not have the answers, people do not have the, the elements of solutions that are, that are necessary. <clears throat> Thank you, Larry. Richard? I have to agree with uh, both Larry and, and, and Greti. Um, I, I would say we don't have uh, what we need. Um, it's obvious if we had what we needed, NCV, uh, not NCVM, I think of NCVM. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that shows how old I am, National Council of <laughs> Minorities. No, you're getting younger. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Checks in the mail, my dear. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, if, if things were the way they should be, um, FBEC would never have formed. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have kept sending people to the unions to get this stuff done. Uh, mm-hmm. And so uh, in terms of, I uh, totally agree with, with Larry, and in terms of like, I almost created this like this, after George Floyd and all the departments were calling us, uh, FBEC, to, to help them get through mm-hmm. the conversations around anti-Black racism. Because when they went to their HR and they went to their uh, diversity and inclusion teams, nobody had the words because we're, in, we're invisible. We're invisible mm-hmm. in policy, and we're invisible in practice in those, in those things. So we words, we came up with tools and resources we shared with lots of people. But what was clear was that people wanted to know 
white people, brown people, even some black folk want to know what they could do, what we could do collectively, what allies can do. So as Larry said, like the first thing is always listening, to be able to listen as individuals and institutions to when black people bring issues of racism, harassment, discrimination, differential treatment, uh, listen without judgment, without fear of what we have to say, mm. and without questioning us as to, you know, you know, you really misunderstood that. Aren't you overreacting? It's like, no, no, this no. is like, this is 300 <laughs> years of experience talking here. My parents passed this down to me. Um, you know, <laughs> also asking, asking that like, allies can ask individuals and, and institutions when they go to black folk and say, you know, well, you know, you're experiencing anti-black racism, sir. So we'll, um, you know, we'll put in a program. We'll put in an action plan. It's like, no, ask me what I need. What do the black employees need? What are they saying? Right. And again, can you listen and receive the answer without judgment, without fear? And trepidation. And lastly, for me, the biggest thing right now, which speaks to FBEC and also what's trying to happen in some of the unions, is that you create and support space for, for Blacks to organize, to be together, um, to, to inform Black employee networks, to, to join FBEC chapters, and for your management and for the unions to support this, because this is a necessary step. In the same way that women's groups were necessary steps back in the day, right? And still are mm -hmm. to some extent. You need to support us as a group that is distinct, that has experienced something that nobody else is experiencing other than our indigenous brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. But we put some of those things in place and then we have the foundation for being able to move forward and to start mm -hmm. having what really is difficult conversations about race and privilege and class and opportunity. Uh, and, and mental illness, because all of that wraps up, right? So I, I think people want easy solutions. So you give them the five-step process. This is how you can be a good ally. But then that's the, just the initial conversation. And then you open that up for like the real work. Last thing I will say on this is that I, I really love what Goretti said about um, the collective agree agreements of all unions being vacuous, empty when it comes to black employees. There's nothing in our collective agreements that speaks to anti-black racism. So of course, mm -hmm. when we have grievances and complaints and we need to go back to the collective agreements, there's no words. In the same way there are no words in our diversity and inclusion policies that the departments push out, there's no words for us. Mm -hmm. So FBEC is working with unions and a union advisory team to come up with those words and the language and the approach so that maybe not this round of bargaining, but maybe the next round of bargaining, we have people that might look like me at the table and say, you know what, maybe we should write some of this into that collective agreement so that people of African descent uh, within the context of the decade have some, you know, rights. And, and maybe that will be, you know, you start building that into policy. And then from policy, you can get implementation. And from implementation, you, get, you can you have potential action to change. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, we, we, uh, I will ask you a question. I know we are running <laughs> of time. You know, when the conversation is, it's important. That's the reality. We, we never have enough time to have that discussion. So I believe, and, I, I, and I'm pushing informally <laughs> my colleagues to organize another conversation like that is important and I can see it from what the participants are, are saying and asking. So uh, I'm gonna, it's only, it's already uh, 13 past four. So we have until uh, 30. Uh, uh, so we're gonna actually, yes, I'm gonna ask you the question and see <laughs> if you can sure. respond, you know, a bit quicker. Sure. Uh, so uh, the last question would be, what can someone who is experiencing anti-Black racism do? So I will start with you, uh, uh, Larry, Richard, and Grady. Uh, so someone who's experiencing anti-Black racism, just, I mean, it's a classic, it's a classic um, uh, thing that we look at when we look at harassment, when we look at bullying, when we look at these uh, behaviors uh, in the workplace or anywhere, the first thing is to stop. 
we we the, when when we are when we are confronted with the behavior stop so far have you gone and no further shall you go that's the i mean the 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 behavior must stop and we must confront it too often i think that when we see it or when we hear it um we tend to hope that this was a one off or that maybe this is something that we you know oh, oh just don't bother with it because um, you know, I, I don't have the time or I don't have the trouble or that that person's an idiot. But I really think that increasingly, just like we are seeing right now, in many places and in many cases, we have to say stop. And, and, and very often, uh, because as was mentioned earlier, it can take so many different forms. So many people can be racist comments or their attitudes or, or their actions without realizing that they are. You just don't, you, you know, they, do, they just don't see it. So when you stop the action and then you tell the person what you have just experienced and what, the, and, and what just happened, then it's up to them. If, I mean, you know, we don't have to have fights on the streets, okay? But we must make sure that we stop it immediately and that we explain or at least try to. And if the person is very conscious of what they're doing, well, then, you know, um, I don't want to say to call the police, but I do want to say that we have to make sure that, you know, first of all, you're safe. And that second of all, that you can at least make sure that the person understood what they just did. That's very, very important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Thank you. Richard? I totally agree with Larry. Um, I, I also tell people to, to, to share what's happening and don't hold it. Don't hold it. Like, tell, tell your cubicle mate. <clears throat> tell your manager, of course. Tell, tell, um, tell your neighbor. Uh, tell your dog when you're walking your dog. Like, tell people. Don't hold it in. Uh, because the holding it in is what many people do for their entire careers. And then they retire and two years later they drop dead or they fall ill even before they, they leave. Uh, some people leave early because of it. You need to be able to express. Uh, and that's partly why it's important to have uh, these employee groups, be the black employee groups or groups within your organization that, um, where you can share. Um, because, uh, that, that's the number one thing. Like I, I've, I've had so many employees, so many employees come to me in my, in my time, grown men, like six foot two crying because of the experience that they've experienced. It's broken. And I'm like, wow. And, you know, you know, working people through, like I'm a counselor. I'm not a counselor. Everybody don't take counseling advice from me. Right. <laughs> Your marriage will be over. <laughs> you will not be but I can tell people what they need in terms of how to address sort of healing around this. Cause I've seen it so many times speak your truth. Uh, and if you, if you feel like you're going to get flack from somebody, find someone else. Um, I think that's partly what's happening since George Floyd, there's been so many of our people, uh, black folk in particular saying, I I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to remain silent. Suddenly there are all these executives that are um, black executives that are coming together and organizing themselves saying, you know, we decided we're going to use our voice. Um, so now suddenly there are all these black groups all over the place starting up. And we love it uh, because I think it's healthy. It's healthy. Um, it's necessary. It's similar to what happened, uh, you know, when the, when the women's movement was, was sort of going strong back in the day. And there was a need to diversify and address, uh, still is, needs to addressify sexism and, and so on in the workplace. But now it's, now it's our turn. Now it's our time. And so if you see this as our time and our right, this is my birthright. I was born in this country. I don't deserve to be treated like crap. Uh, so I have a right to stand up for that and speak my truth. And so all of us do. And then we do it in a way that's around moving towards addressing these issues in a way that's concrete, real, right? That means, means change in our workplace without fear. Because the, the, the most thing, what we can be afraid of, the thing that we should be most afraid of is that we don't speak up. Uh, as Larry says, force it to stop immediately, but that you speak up. If you don't speak up, what kills you is, is the time of that eating away at your soul. Um, so that's, you know, 
totally, totally agree with my, with my, with my man there. Ready? Oui, je ne peux que convenir vraiment à, avec euh, confrère Larry puis Richard. Euh, non seulement il faut dénoncer, il faut le dire, il faut le dire le plus tôt possible. Il ne faut pas attendre que ça, ça vous détruise. Parce que l'un des enjeux que nous pouvons avoir aussi dans, dans les dossiers dans, dans, en arbitrage, c'est que l'employeur peut dire et il va dire souvent, je ne savais pas, euh, l'employeur ne m'a jamais dit euh, que euh, mes commentaires, mon comportement, euh, la nuit. Alors, au lieu d'attendre et de venir, euh, d'attendre à la fin, de nous arriver, euh, je me rappelle de cette personne-là qui était complètement détruite avec euh, des problèmes de santé, bien entendu. Et euh, ce qui est arrivé, c'est que la personne ne peut plus même retourner à milieu de travail. Alors, il faut le dire, il faut le dire le plus tôt possible. Merci. Merci, Gauthier. Mais je vais en profiter rapidement parce qu'on a quelques minutes. Je vais te poser une question rapide. Qu'est-ce qui arrive dans le cas où la personne sent que euh, si j'en parle, justement, je peux vivre des conséquences, je peux avoir des conséquences? Est-ce que mon, mon superviseur va m'écouter? Est-ce que je vais avoir des alliés au travail qui vont être là, ne serait-ce que pour témoigner? Parce que des fois, on se dit, OK, on a des alliés. Mais quand il vient le temps de, de remplir euh, euh, une de, en fait, la plainte et d'un coup, on n'a plus de témoin, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire? <rire> oui, je comprends que c'est à double tranchant, mais euh, de toutes les façons, euh, moi, je dirais il faut le dire. Parce que même si vous ne le dites pas, ça va vous revenir et ça va vous, vous, vous revenir tard et ça va vous, vous bouleverser. Parce que quand vous le dites, bien entendu, ça peut vous partager avec une autre personne. Et la personne, là, elle a une ou deux personnes qui peuvent, s'il y a une personne qui dit, je ne peux pas témoigner euh, pour votre compte, peut-être l'autre personne pourra témoigner pour vous. Mais non seulement ça, quand vous euh, parlez de la chose qui, qui vous ennuie dans votre cœur, vous vous libérez d'une certaine façon, puis euh, vous vous levez pour vos droits. C'est vos droits, il faut le dire, il faut contester. On ne peut pas juste rester en silence. Même si vous restez en silence, malheureusement, vous allez encaisser, puis encaisser. Puis euh, votre superviseur, votre employeur, il va juste profiter, il va médicaliser maintenant votre situation pour vous dire, oh, j'ai besoin que vous allez voir un médecin, vous ne pouvez pas retourner. Et là, vous êtes congédié que vous le dites ou pas, alors vous allez subir. Moi, mon, ma recommandation, mon conseil, c'est de le dire vraiment et de le dire le plus tôt possible. Merci, Darlene. Merci, Goethe. On va aller euh, rapidement avec une question du, des participants. I'm going to ask you that question and I hope that we can share the time between you, among you. Uh, the question is, how can black workers can involve or be recruited to be active in their union? You can share whoever wants to go first. Okay, I'll go. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, 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 look at me. Um, you know, uh, I think um, I, I, I think that you know when you go to that union meeting, and instead of thinking, I don't understand anything that is happening here uh, because they're using rules of order. Okay or the, way, the, 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 the language and the terminology that's being used already is something that is being used to exclude people, okay? <laughs> you know, you, you, you have, you, 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 so many people go to that union meeting because they, they say, I want to get involved, and they, they leave the meeting, and, and they're pulling out, I don't have any hair, but, <laughs> um, but, but um, you know, like Richard would be pulling on his locks, you know, it's like, It's like, this is, this is absolutely crazy, but no, learn what it is that is going on because the union belongs to us. You are paying your dues. I use the analogy of the municipal council, you know, the, you have a problem on your street, you know, and everything. We will complain till the cows come home, but we will not go to the municipal council meeting to stand up in front of the councillor and the mayor and all the rest and say, this is what needs to happen, all right? Well, if you're not going to go, 
then don't complain if your union's not coming through for you. So you have to get involved. And, 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 when you, and, and most people get involved in the union, thing happened to them in the workplace. There was a grievance, there was something that happened, et cetera, and then, and then all of a sudden, then they get involved. But don't wait for something to happen to you in the workplace. Find out what it's about, Black people, and this belongs to us. And if the, if the executive tries to exclude you, bring more people. And then when it's time for the elections, bring your people with you and go to get a vote and get yourself voted and elected and, 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 and start reappropriating what belongs to us. And the union belongs to us. And the membership of the union is what drives the union. If the membership is not involved, then you have a smaller number of people who are making all the decisions and the membership is not being considered. So get out there, get involved, get the education. It's, it's, it's free. Okay. You will be first, get the education, go out there and get involved and don't take anything from anybody that's going to say, oh, you're wasting your time. Because I never wasted my time in the union. And I feel that after all the years that I've been in the union, I have done my small part. But if everybody does their small part, then we get a big part. And I'm talking to all my black sisters, brothers, and friends who are out there and who could do so much more by getting involved. Don't get discouraged because that's part of the systemic part of the, race, of the racism to exclude you from what you can be using to get what you need. So it's not a panacea. It's not going to be a, the, 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 the solution to everything, but make sure that other people aren't making the decisions for you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Larry. <clears throat> Richard and Kuredi. Just, just really quick, uh, every, mm -hmm. everything that Larry said, uh, he's got more experience <laughs> in it than I do, uh, for real. Um, um, it's, it's, I joined the union because um, um, there's so many employees were coming to me and asking for help that some a white guy came up to me and said, Richard, you should join the union. You'd have protections under the union to do what you're doing uh, because you can't talk with management right now because you're just an employee. And I go, good oh, point. really? So um, it, was, it, was, it was good for me to do that. Um, there was another question that I responded to in the question and answer about how to bring black employees in. White unionists make the space and then do your work to help to convince black potential leaders, because we are leaders, to join in on, on that space. You need to create the space because the, the space is, ex is, is exclusionary. The language of Robert's Rules of Order, the culture of the union is alien to a many people of color, blacks uh, from Canada and, and all. So you're gonna have to create space for us. When people come to us and say they wanna do union work with FBEC, because we know all the unions, we direct them back to the unions and we try to, and we hope that those unions will receive them and give them a place, right? Because there are people, very rarely do people come asking for union, but it's one of the best training grounds. And regardless of what anybody says about this being a, a hindrance of your career, I, I, I had a deputy minister tell me that she was a stop shop steward and she learned a lot about what the employees want. So she became manager and became deputy minister because of that experience. Union gives you great experience, so you can't look at it as if you're going to do it as a career limiting. You get, you get a, quite a bit more power than you ever had, and you can influence things and processes within your workplaces that benefit your, your fellow colleagues. So it's a cell, and it's, it's by creating space. Very important. Critical mass, I think, is partly what Larry was talking about, and Goretti is going to be talking about, too. Critical mass is having the numbers in the union to be able to affect change. So the challenges that some of the unions are experiencing internally can be, can be corrected somewhat by good leadership, strong leadership, and more people being involved in those unions. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Unfortunately, this is the time that we have. It's uh, 28 past, past four. So before I leave, because I don't want to miss anything, I have to thank you for being here, for, for, for accepted the invitation. Larry Russo, Goroti, je dois bien dire ton nom, Goroti. Goroti Fukua Musunge, merci <laughs> beaucoup. Richard Chol, 
Thank you very much. And I also want to thank um, um, the technicians, also the interpreters, and as well as my colleagues. They worked so hard. Ils, elles ont, je crois que c'est que des femmes, hein, si je m'abuse pas. Elles ont travaillé d'arrache-pied pour que ce webinaire soit un webinaire aussi intéressant, éducatif, avec un sujet aussi important. Donc, uh, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, uh, if it weren't you, well, <laughs> we wouldn't have a webinar uh, so uh, deep. So you can uh, actually uh, send your questions at human rights dash droit personne droit au pluriel at psc dash afpc dot com uh, pour les questions. Donc je l'ai lu en français en anglais vu que l'AFPC est un organe qui uh, qui promote et qui uh, qui promote et qui fait en sorte que les deux langues officielles soient uh, utilisées équitablement. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I won't name anyone because I I, I, I my fear is to uh, forget someone from the committee. So accept my sincere uh, um, thanks and and hope that we can also uh, join in again for a webinar. Uh, so deep, and then we can discuss as well inter intersectionality, which we we haven't had the time to to talk about. And we know it's a big piece. So uh, stay safe, stay strong, and uh, take care of yourself. Bye bye.